friends, welcome again to the seven deadly myths of Christianity. We are glad that you have tuned in. During this seminar, we are looking at some of the most important Bible prophecies. Tonight is no exception, very important subject that we'll be studying straight from the Word of God. I'd like to welcome those joining us across the country and around the world. Also those here in person, we are glad you've come out again this evening. We have been blessed as we study these important Bible truths. Now, we want to remind you, we do have a free offer. It's a magazine entitled, The Rest of Your Life. It actually goes along with tonight's presentation. Really great magazine. Now, if you're outside of North America and you'd like to receive it, we want to encourage you to go to the website, deadlymyths.com. You can also find it at the Amazing Facts website. And there you'll be able to download the magazine and read it for yourself, The Rest of Your Life. Well, before we get to our study today, we have been so blessed with some excellent music so far during the seminar. I know it'll continue, and we're so delighted that Jonathan is here to lead us in the music. So at this time, we want to invite Jonathan to come, and he'll bring us our musical item at this time. Oh, love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe, that in thine ocean depths its flow may richer, fuller be. O oh, joy that seekest me through pain, I cannot close my heart to thee. I trace the rainbow through the rain and feel the promise is not vain that morn shall tearless be. O oh, cross that liftest up my head, I dare not ask to fly from thee. I lay in dust life's glory dead, and from the ground there blossoms red that morn shall tearless be. My Jesus, I love Thee, I know Thou art mine. For Thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior, Art thou, if ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, Tis now. Thank you, Michelle and Jonathan. Let's bow our heads and pray. Oh, loving Father, you've told us there is a way that seems right to a man, and in the end it leads to death. And Lord, there's far too much of man's wisdom that has penetrated into the church, too many deceptions that have crept in, and Lord, we need wisdom. And so we're praying and asking that you would be with us tonight, be with our speaker, speak to our hearts directly to them via your Holy Spirit and your servant. We pray that you would anoint his lips 
And Lord, you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see. And Lord, you would show us what you would have us do with the truth. Lord, you've called us to a connection with you, to abide with you. And that's what we want to do tonight. We pray that you'd help us to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, Scott Ritzma. I want to invite you to turn to Revelation chapter 14, where we will be in just a few minutes. Tonight's message, entitled Lawless Christianity, part one, is part one of two. Tomorrow night we will do this same topic as a follow-up, but I have to say right out of the gates in Lawless Christianity, part one, this will be a teaching from God's Word that will challenge us, where the first several meetings were pretty easy truths to accept. The Bible is the inspired Word of God, and it gives us hope in the future of Jesus' second coming that we will put on immortality and his his crucifixion and sacrifice on the cross is for our salvation and yes I will receive Jesus as my Savior and Satan will be ended and the earth will be made new like all of these inspiring truths so it's very simple when we see the love of Jesus to accept him as our Savior. Now, many people, though, have come to religious meetings and they've said, I'm going to make a commitment to Jesus Christ to receive him as my Lord and Savior. And then we forget about the Lord part. Because if he's Lord, if he's the king, the king also has a law, doesn't he? And so obedience requires maybe a deeper level of commitment and humility to come before Jesus with a mindset that we will Obey whatever we see in his, in his word. Now, I want to begin with a thought about God's law that comes from Psalm 119. A great psalm. You should study that one sometime for devotional exercise. Beautiful psalm. It says in that psalm that those who love God's law will have great peace. Great peace have they which love thy law. Now that might run contrary to our postmodern culture that says, well, you're going to find inner peace by self-actualizing your own preferences and pleasures and desires. No, God says you will have peace when you love his standard for righteousness in his law. Now you know this is a degenerate age in which we live. I won't spend any more seconds recounting the darkness and nastiness and immorality but it was prophesied. Look at this in 2 Timothy. It says, In the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, and lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. That describes our day, doesn't it? And so does Matthew chapter 24, verse 37, where Jesus predicted that in the last days, in the last generation, it would be as it was in the days of Noah, when the thoughts of mankind were only evil continually. Luke 17, 28 says, In the last days it will be as it was in the days of Lot. Lot with Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember that whole scene with the come give us your men. Ezekiel 16 tells us that those Sodomites were lacking in concern for the poor. They were overfed. They were idle. Does that describe our society today? Including the thing about the immorality of Sodom. So you can sum it up. The immorality of the last days was simply this from Matthew. Because lawlessness will abound, Jesus says, the love of many will grow cold. So you've got lawlessness and love growing cold. Did you notice how those two go hand in glove? Lawlessness and a lack of love or lovelessness are really tied at the hip. Which is contrary to the way that many think when they go, well, we don't want to have law, we want to have love. Well, no, Jesus says that the law of God is an expression of love. What are the two greatest commandments? Love God, love your neighbor. The whole law depends on that principle of love. Love and law are not in conflict. They are in harmony. That's why when the love of many is growing cold in the last days, lawlessness is also abounding. When we think about this in the context we've been describing it about prophecy in the last days, that makes us think about 
Well, the lawlessness of the world is naturally going to be in place. We would expect, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, is the credo of a lost generation. But what about lawless Christianity, is the name of this particular session. This series is Seven Deadly Myths in Christianity. Do Christians really accept any sort of lawlessness, it might come as a surprise because you go, well, every Christian believes in and honors God's Ten Commandment law, right? Christians have fought unanimously and tirelessly to promote Ten Commandment monuments, for example. Well, you'd be surprised how much of Christian teaching today, supposedly Christian teaching, is undermining the very foundation of God's moral law. This is quite possibly, of our seven deadly myths, this is quite possibly the most potent, far-reaching, and destructive myth of them all. So we're going to do a basic teaching, New Testament teaching, on the law of God and understand the whole picture from Eden to eternity on how God's law stands in the last days and through to the end. But first, we have to repeat the gospel because the gospel is the foundation of the Christian faith. It is everything for us. And what is the basic teaching of the gospel? It is that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so while the wages of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Does that sum it up pretty well? Jesus' sacrifice at the cross for us. We'll see what he's doing in the heavenly sanctuary in a future session presently. But that, that concept of the gospel of Jesus Christ when he came and died as our substitute and surety includes embedded in it the concept of sin. That we are all sinners in need of a savior. And you might say, well, yeah, I'm aware of that. But you have, have you ever wondered what is the definition of sin to a New Testament Christian? Let's put it on the screen. Sin is the transgression of the law. That's a scripture to memorize, to remember, because I'm going to ask you about it again. It's foundational for our understanding of the gospel and for our understanding of God's law. What is the definition of sin? It is breaking God's law, breaking, violating, transgressing the law of God. In fact, Paul says the law defines what sin is in Romans 3, 20, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So that's two New Testament texts telling us that the very definition of sin is violation of the law of God. When we encounter God's standard for our righteousness in the Ten Commandments and we look at our own our own imperfections, our own sin, we cry out for a healer at that point because it diagnoses our condition very effectively. By the, by the law is the knowledge of sin. Jesus says, I will forgive you and cleanse you. That's the good part of the gospel, isn't it? He says, I'm going to give you a new heart and a right spirit. I will take away your stony heart and give you a heart of flesh. It is no longer I who live now, but Christ who lives in me. It is the old things have gone away, and behold, all things are new. That's the gospel promise, that, that we will be forgiven and cleansed from all unrighteousness. Now, as we walk in that promise of new life, we can embrace a new covenant promise. Listen to this from Psalm 40. I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within your, my heart. How did David get to the point where he delighted to do the will of God? He had sinned terribly. He had confessed, had to confess his sin and repent of his sin. But he came to the point where he realized that living in violation of God's law does not make your life better. It, it brings misery and, and broken relationships and guilt and shame and remorse and destructive things. When he had the law of God written on his heart, he could delight in obeying God. Now, how is that a new covenant promise? I emphasized that a moment ago. Have you ever read in Hebrews 8? It echoes what David said there in Psalm 40, with the law being written on his heart. That's not just in the Old Testament in the Psalms. In Hebrews 8, verses 8 to 10, it says that God says, I'm going to make a new covenant with my people. And here's what it's defined as in the New Testament. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. So do the Ten Commandments go away in the New Testament? You're saying, Scott, this is obvious. We all believe in the New But you would be surprised 
especially as we go forward in this message and see why some want to wear away that foundation written in stone. But it says the very definition of the new covenant is the law of God being written on our heart and on our mind. And what is the New Testament definition of sin again? It is the transgression of that law. So that's why I said we're doing a basic New Testament teaching on the law of God. The Old Testament is just as inspired, but we can see that this continues in through our day as New Testament Christians. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome, John says. Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come unto me, you, you are, ye who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's not burdensome. It's not a grievous thing to say, what is God's moral standard for me in the Ten Commandments? I want to show my love to him. It says, this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And if you love me, keep my commandments, Jesus said in John 14, verse 15. So then obedience to God goes from drudgery and obligation to just an inevitability. I love him and I want to please him. It goes from something that is burdensome to something that is, I delight to do thy will, O my God, for thy law is within my heart. But for those who pride rises up and say, I don't want to do it God's way, I want my own preference and opinion to rule, John has some strong counsel for us. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. That's some strong medicine that we might need at times. If we're kicking against the goads and saying, I don't need that authority in my... God is our authority because he is our Father, our Heavenly Father. And we can't say, well, I know you, I am saved, I know Jesus. But then we say, I don't need his commandments. He is our Savior and our Lord, isn't he? Now, this is where this gets downright apocalyptic. You're, you're, you're in Revelation 14, but first I've got to put Revelation 11, verse 19, on the screen in a moment. Now, why 11, 19? Are you aware of Revelation 12, 13, and 14 being the real heart of Revelation, the climactic events of Revelation? We're going to study that more in coming sessions, 12, 13, and 14. The verse that sets up that whole section of Revelation is the last verse of chapter 11. And here's what it says. John sees into heaven, into the temple of God. It was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. What was seen in his temple? The ark of his covenant. And it's surrounded by lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. My friends, what is in the ark of the covenant? The Ten Commandments of God are pictured as being not just elevated in this heavenly place, but surrounded by this dramatic scene, this multi-sensory sights and sounds, and the verse that leads into the conflict in the last days. Ooh, we're going to come back to that. You think God's Ten Commandments are still around? They sure are. The Ark of the Covenant in heaven, John sees it right up there in the New Testament. Very important. We saw two meetings ago on Sabbath morning, message number two, three meetings ago, we saw... The Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians 2 is referred to three times as being against God's law. Do you remember that? The lawless one, the lawless one, lawlessness. A threefold repetition, which is emphasis, which is an exclamation point, that he's against God's law. Daniel 7 has the Antichrist as thinking he will change God's law. But then in Revelation, we saw in chapter 12 and 14 and 22, we saw God's people in the last days will be keeping the commandments, the commandments, the commandments. I know I'm repeating from a previous session, but now you see that that conflict between Christ and Satan, when we were looking at this great controversy between Jesus and the enemy of souls, it is over God's authority, isn't it? Who's right to, who has the right to be worshipped and obeyed? And the conflict down into the last days, commandments, commandments, commandments. That was Revelation 12, 17, Revelation 12. 14, 12, and Revelation 22, 14. I know we're going fast. Maybe you got those all down. If you didn't get them down, send me an email, beltoftruthministries at gmail.com, and I will give you all the texts that you might have missed because I'm going so obnoxiously fast. But back in college, I remember being encountered and confronted with this idea among Christians and Bible-believing, New Testament-believing Christians, and, and, and I heard, like, God's law was abolished. 
And that came to me as a shock uh, and something that couldn't be right, because how is that possible? And I heard God trying to obey God's law through the grace that he provides, because I love him, was called legalism. I thought, how is that legal? Am I saved by grace through faith and not of works? But I love God, so I want to obey him. Like, how is that legal? I, I was perplexed and confused by it because it didn't make sense. They would say things to me like, well, the law is made void now through faith. Well, have you read that in the Bible? Do we then make void, make void the law through faith? Paul says, God forbid. We don't make void the law through faith. Yea, we establish the law. I remember also hearing this phrase in the Bible, under the law, that we are no longer under the law, but under grace. And I, I scratched my head. What does this phrase mean? Because this certainly can't mean that I can just rebel against God. Like, with, that's what it means to be a Christian. You've received grace. Now you get to be a rebel. Like, well, that doesn't compute, right? Especially with all the texts we saw about God's commandments are important. This is love of God's commandments. If we say we don't need to keep them, we're a liar and the truth is not in us. You know, the Bible is clear on that. So what do we make sense of? How do we make sense of a phrase like that? Well, have you ever gotten, uh, okay, can I, can we be vulnerable here? Okay, I admit, maybe you will admit too. Can I get a show of hands? How many of you have ever found yourself going a few miles an hour over the posted speed limit? Okay, thank you. Whew. I was a little bit concerned there for a second. How many of you ever gotten pulled over? I have, okay. How many of you have had the police officer show grace to you and not write you a ticket. Okay, you are under grace now, aren't you? When, when he leaves and goes back into his squad car and you resume your drive, do you say to yourself, well, now I can drive whatever speed I want because I'm under grace. No, of course not. I'm even more careful to obey. Paul says this, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. We don't, what is sin again? I had that word underlined there. What is sin? Transgression of the law. Well, shall I, shall I transgress God's law because I am under grace now? He says, God forbid. Romans 7, 12 and 22, Paul says, I delight in the law of God. It is holy, just, and good. Jesus says, I have not come to destroy the law. I have not come to abolish this. Not one jot or tittle is going anywhere. And he said, if you love me, keep my commandments, as we saw earlier. He said, if you want to enter life, keep my commandments, in Matthew 19, verse 17. So we can't live an openly rebellious life against God, put ourselves on Satan's side, say, I believe God, so I'm saved. James said, even the demons believe and they tremble. God will always forgive us if we've sinned and stumbled. He always will forgive us, but we can't thumb our nose at his commandments. We are even more careful to obey when we see the grace and love of Jesus Christ. So we obey out of gratitude. So grace brings us power. Grace brings us a renewed emphasis and a love for the truth, a power to cleanse the life. Now, here's where we're really going with this concept of God's law in the seven deadly myths series. James says, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So Satan doesn't usually get Christians to go, Ten Commandments? I don't need any of those. I'll just go out and steal and murder and commit adultery and I can do whatever. I don't hear that really very often out there. But if he can get us to, to, to neglect one of the ten, then he will have done his job. He will create lawlessness by undermining one of the ten. So are all ten important? Let me ask you. Are all, are all ten important? Are you sure? Are you sure? You're saying amen. Some might say yes. Of course, Scott, why you even ask? It's not a trick question, but it's a hard question for some. I told you you'd be in Revelation 14. We're finally there in verse 6. John sees another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. See, the, the talk about the law is actually good news. Remember, law and love combined when lawlessness abounds. Then also the love grows cold. When love abounds, we will be law-abiding citizens of the kingdom of God. So this is the gospel to preach unto them that dwell upon the earth. And what does he say in verse 7 with a loud voice? Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship 
Him, remember this phrase, worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Worship him that made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. We're going to see what this has to do with God's law in just a minute. But right now, it's God as creator, isn't it? Do you think God knew that in the last days, this message would need to go out because there would be controversy over creation? Darwinism would emerge. God knows these things in advance. So it's an emphasis in the last days of God as the creator. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, the psalmist says, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. And I just imagine that six-day creation, what that was like. To be a fly on the wall and witness, God speaks and it's done. Powerful. When you read that text, don't you just literally want to worship him that made the heaven, the earth, and the sea, as it says there. The angel crying out in the last days, worship him that made the heaven, the earth, the sea. When I contemplate the vastness of the universe, the complexity of DNA, I worship him that made the heaven, the earth, and the sea. When I view a beautiful sunset, or a waterfall, or hear the laugh of my three-year-old child. I am in awe of the Creator, and I worship Him who made the heaven, the earth, and the sea. Maybe you just see a, a, a mother, a doe and her fawn, or a duck with the ducklings swimming on the pond. The beauties of creation make us go, I worship Him who made the heaven, the earth, and the sea. And people say, well, okay, you know, I was there during the early session where we saw how prophecy validated the book of Daniel. And we can see historically and look back how Daniel predicted events that have transpired. And we can have absolute certainty on the validity of Daniel. We saw the textual evidence of the New Testament and the evidence for the resurrection that's undeniable. So we can trust in that. But people still say... Oh, come on, fairy tales from the books of Moses, Red Sea parting, and these things, a creation in six days. This, is, this couldn't be a creation in six days. That's a skeptic says, no, I'm going with Darwinism in the face of all contradictory evidence and lack of evidence for Darwinism. But the idea is put out there that all oh, these stories were repeated dozens and dozens and dozens and hundreds of times over so many generations from Adam all the way down to Moses who wrote it down in the book of Genesis. Oh, this is just myths that built up over the years and legends and tales. Can I show you a neat chart? Look at how old all these people lived to according to the Bible from Adam to his son Seth all the way down to Methuselah who lived 969 years. Look at the blue arrows. Adam was alive during Methuselah's life. He could tell the creation story to Methuselah. Methuselah could tell it to Shem. Shem could tell it to Abraham. So in just three tellings of the creation story, you're already at the patriarchs. At which point, there's only 400 more years in Egyptian bondage. And then it's Moses, and he writes down Genesis. So this isn't uh, uh, the way that the skeptic would make it sound. And if you understand ancient cultures and oral cultures where you don't have written uh, literary understandings of, of rec re recorded history, oral transmissions are meticulously accurate, surprisingly accurate to those of us in a literary Western culture. We're like, how is that possible? Did you know that the average Jewish youth by age 12 would have the Torah memorized, the first five books of the Bible memorized. So the memory was incredible. You can go to places today where literacy hasn't yet come in, and the oral memory of a sermon you preached years ago, they've still got it word for word. It's incredible. So this is credible in terms of the passing down of the stories. But to believers in the Bible, we're not just looking at this as a history book. We know it's inspired. We know Moses was a prophet of God, so we can take it to the bank on that level as well. Can you turn to Genesis 2 with me? Because God was very interested in preserving the record of creation. And there's a specific text here in Genesis 2 that, and this is where we're going to get back into the law of God topic, it shows God as creator by instituting and establishing the seven-day week with the capstone of the week being a memorial of creation. Let's read it in Genesis 2, verses 1 through 3. This is after the creation. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. 
because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. God established the seven-day week by creating this world in six literal days and resting on the seventh day, lest we forget the creator God, which so many have. Now, in that Genesis account, it refers to the Sabbath. The Sabbath is most well known, not from the Genesis text that we read, but from the fourth commandment. It's one of the ten, isn't it? Let's read it on the screen from Exodus 20. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter, nor your male servant, female servant, cattle, strangers within thy gates. And here's the reason why God asks us to do this. For in six days the Lord made, where have you heard this phrase before? Made the heavens, the earth, and the sea. Ah, that's a quote from Revelation, isn't it? And all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So John the Revelator in Revelation 14, verse 7 that we read, it, he quotes from the fourth commandment, made the heaven, the earth, and the sea. I remember hearing one Bible scholar say that was the longest quote from the Old Testament in the entire book of Revelation. So that's an emphatic point. He is the creator in the last days. Worship him. And John quotes the commandment about the day of worship, doesn't he? And why is this so important? Well, Genesis 2 and Exodus 20, you see both three things referenced. God rested on the day, God blessed the day, God sanctified the day to memorialize creation that we might worship him who made the heaven, the earth, and the sea. In Exodus 20, we are told to keep it because God created in six days, God rested on the seventh day, and God hallowed the day. Again, to put in our memory and in our weekly routine the worship of the Creator God so nobody will ever forget who He is. Because remember, Satan is trying to usurp God's throne. We saw that in, in meeting number two. He said, I will be in the position of God. But wait a minute, you're not the creator, right? You don't have any right to command people to obey you and worship you. Only God is the creator. It says in Revelation 4, verse 11, that it says, why is God worthy? You are worthy, O Lord, to receive or worship because you created all things. Revelation 4, verse 11, God is worthy of worship because he created all things. So Satan's position is absolutely fraudulent on its face. The entire world today observes a seven-day week. Have you noticed that? Have you ever wondered why? Where did the seven-day week come from? Because you could, you could, on a secular level, explain the year the, 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 with the sun. You could explain the, the month with the moon. So all human cultures who are isolated from one another look at the same heavenly bodies and they go sun, moon, and everybody ends up with a year and with a month. Uh, but some of them, their year is a little different, their month is a little different, whether you go by the month this way and the year that way. But why is everybody so particularly the same on a seven-day week where there's nothing in the sky telling us about a seven-day cycle? Where did this all come from? Cultures are remarkably consistent in observing a seven-day week. Well, the fourth commandment tells us how and why. It says, remember. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Humanity hasn't forgotten the creation event. Cultures have received that on down the line, even through paganism, continuing in the seven-day week. Human languages, even the most ancient of human languages, have kept the record of the seven-day week and the seventh day as the Sabbath as a time capsule that dates way back, thousands of years, predating Moses. Ancient languages, the seventh day of the week, many of them is Sabbath or rest day and a variation of that. Even today, Spanish, what is the seventh day of the week? Saturday is called Sabado. In Russian, it's called Subota. So in more than 100 languages, again, including ancient languages that predated Moses, you've got Sabbath as the name of the seventh day of the week. There's only one way to answer that and explain that historically. I mean, I, there's no secular explanation for that. The answer is God created the world in six days. He rested on the seventh day, and he made that day holy in Eden. So the entire world still tips their hat to the creator and his seven-day week and his seventh-day Sabbath. Um, the, the atheists were well aware of this in the French Revolution, um, in communist Russia. They experimented with different lengths of weeks. 
because they said, uh, well, we, we can't have this seven-day week thing around because we know what that's about. And they were trying to impose atheism on the society, so they did a five-day week or a ten-day week. Always was disastrous when they tried such things, but they wanted to avoid the biblical uh, rel relevance and reality of the seventh-day week. The seven-day week, rather. Now, I, rem I grew up um, uh, thinking of the seventh day of the week and Sabbath observance as a Jewish thing. Did anybody else have that thought uh, in the past? Like, oh, that's what the Jews do because they're most famous for it. They still do that to this day, most Christians being um, first day of the week observant. But when in Earth's history was the Sabbath instituted? We just read it in Genesis 2. When was that? That was in creation week. Now, when, were the first, when did the Jewish nation become founded? That was with Father Abraham, right? 2,000 years later or so. So for 2,000 years of Earth's history, you have the Sabbath being instituted before any Jews were ever around. So Jesus actually made this clear. What did he say? The Sabbath was made for the Jews or the Sabbath was made for man, for all mankind? Because Adam is the father of all mankind, Adam and Eve. Sabbath was made. Did you ever notice that? You may be a Gentile, had no connection to Judaism, but you love the Lord Jesus. You, you read the Word of God, and you've always gone to church on the first day of the week. And then you read in Mark 2, verse 27, Jesus said, I actually made the Sabbath for you, for all of mankind. And that's a wonderful, blessed, beautiful thing, because when God gave the Ten Commandments, it's not burdensome, it's not grievous. It's meant for the best possible way of living that there is. And it's meant they're written in stone to show that they will endure, that it's not just for a specific people for a specific period of time. Thou shalt not kill doesn't apply only to the Jews, does it? Thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not steal. The Ten Commandments predated Mount Sinai, and they continue in the New Testament, and they're up in heaven now pointing to the last days. This is a mention of this is for all people in all places and all times, written in stone. Now, even in Genesis, Abraham was keeping the commandments of God. This is well before Exodus 20. Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So we sometimes think of the commandments as being a Jewish thing, as part of Mount Sinai and Exodus 20. But the commandments were around long before Mount Sinai. Abraham was keeping the commandments there in Genesis. In Exodus 16, before Mount Sinai and Exodus 20, four chapters earlier, the Sabbath was being observed. God sent the manna. You remember the story? And he said, on Friday, pick up double because I don't want you out gathering manna on the seventh day. Well, the Ten Commandments hadn't been given yet. Did they know about the Sabbath yet? Well, they sure did. That's why the commandment says remember because it's been around since Eden. This is not a new institution at that point. Four chapters earlier, God rebukes them for breaking the Sabbath before it's written in stone on Mount Sinai. Exodus 16, 28, he says, the Lord says, How long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? Was it wrong for Cain to kill Abel? Of course, well before the commandments were written in stone. Was it wrong for Sarah to have her household gods, the uh, wife of Abraham? That was wrong. And it was wrong for the people to gather manna on the Sabbath, even before the Ten Commandments were written down. Now fast forward to the New Testament. You get Jesus says, I have kept my Father's commandments. Jesus kept the commandments, which you're going, oh, of course he, yeah, that, 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 that's taken for granted because he never sinned. The Bible says he was the, 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 the unblemished lamb, the lamb without blemish. So he kept his father's commandments, and the New Testament definition of sin is keeping the father's commandments. We want to do the same. It continues from before Mount Sinai and after into the New Testament. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. If anybody would have said, we're not going to do the Sabbath thing anymore, it would have been Jesus. But he says, I've kept the Sabbath commandment. Luke 4, 16, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. I hope we come to worship on the Sabbath day. That's an important, it's a commandment in the word of God to worship him who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and rest on this holy Sabbath day. Now, just in case we're wondering, some people have wondered, do we still have like the same seven day week or has the week gotten messed up over time? Because there's been different, there's been changes in the year because the year and the moon are just a teeny tiny bit off and you have leap year and people haven't always done leap year and so you adjust the calendar. Have people ever adjusted the seven day week so that 
what we know as Saturday is a different day than it was 2,000 years ago. I can, I can relieve you of that burden. The U.S. Naval Observatory has actually asked about this very question. Here's their document that they, that they stated definitively from the scholars on this matter. We have had occasion to investigate the results of the works of specialists in chronology, and we have never wa- found one of them that has ever had the slightest doubt about the continuity of the weekly cycle since long before the Christian era. So whatever Jesus was keeping, and he said he was keeping the right one because he kept his father's commandments, we know it hasn't changed since Jesus' day and wouldn't have changed before that, or Jesus would have had to make that adjustment himself. But if you want to know for sure if it's still the seven-day cycle and it hasn't gotten interrupted or messed up or moved, just ask the Jews. They are obsessively meticulous about their Sabbath, and it would never happen that every Jew in the world at one time missed the day. Whoops, we messed that up. Not a chance in the world. Go over to Luke 23 with me, please. And we're going to see, just to make sure we get the days right here, which is which, um, we're going to read the end of chapter 23 and the beginning of chapter 24. And this is the crucifixion of Jesus. He this is, this is a, what, what day, by the way, was Jesus crucified? What day of the week? It was Friday. People call it Good Friday. Indeed, it was good for the redemption of mankind that he paid that penalty for the sin of man. Let's start in verse 52. This man, Joseph of Arimathea, the day that Jesus died on the cross, went unto Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. And he took it down and wrapped it in linen and laid it in a sepulcher that was hewn in stone wherein never man before was laid. And that day was, what does it call it there? The preparation, or some translations, preparation day. So we might call it Friday in our English, Good Friday, tradition calls it. The Bible simply refers to it as preparation day. It's not, it's not a sin to call it Friday, by the way, but just biblically, why would it be called preparation day? Preparation for what? Well, let's read on. It says, and that day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew on. So you want to be preparing for the day of rest so that you don't get caught off guard and, oh, no, I forgot to, and now I have to, you know, do something that I shouldn't do on the Sabbath. So the preparation day was an important day of the week, the sixth day of the week. The Sabbath drew on. So it's about to be Sabbath. By the way, it's about to be sunset. We'll talk about that more tomorrow, actually. But when the women came uh, from from Galilee and they followed after behind the sepulcher and saw how his body was laid, verse 56, the women returned and prepared spices and ointments. So this is still preparation day. They are preparing spices and ointments. Then the rest of the verse, it changes now the next day, and they rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. So very simple. Here you are on Friday. Jesus died. The body is taken down, put in the tomb. On the preparation day, the women are preparing their spices, and then the Sabbath, which was drawing on, is now here, and the women rest the Sabbath day according to the commandment. Now upon the first day of the week, I'm in the beginning of chapter 24. Now we're on the first day of the week. So what was the day before the first day of the week? It was called the Sabbath day according to the commandment. The day before the first day of the week was called the Sabbath day according to the commandment. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, the the grave, the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. So they're resuming their work, aren't they? On what day of the week? The first day of the week, they're resuming their work. So it was preparation day, then Sabbath according to the commandment, then the first day of the week. So we got that that delineation of that order. Good Friday, then the Sabbath day according to the commandment, then resurrection morning, the first day of the week. That was a beautiful, powerful... It's almost criminal to study this text to make sure we get the days right. And here we are looking at the crucifixion, the resurrection, the biggest and most important truths. we got to hang out there for just a second because these women, they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. They entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. What day did Jesus rise? The first day of the week, the day before that, the Sabbath day. This really gives us a deeper and bigger and more beautiful truth about the fourth commandment than God's people had had before this particular weekend that we're studying. Because you know God finished his work on the sixth day in Eden, right? And then he rested on the seventh day, right? Well, did he finish another work on the sixth day this week? Oh yeah, this is massive stuff. Redemption. 
the two greatest acts in the history of the universe, creation and redemption, were both finished on the sixth day, and God rested from them on the seventh day. Rested in Eden, rested in the tomb, asleep in the tomb. Wow. That is powerful stuff. And the Bible actually says the Sabbath represents redemption, not just a memorial of creation. Look at this text. Moreover, I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who what? Sanctifies them. The Sabbath, even back then in Ezekiel in the Old Testament, the Sabbath was a symbol of salvation and a symbol of God as creator. Which makes sense, because the two are linked, aren't they? The only one who can create in me a clean heart is the one who created the world. The only one who can recreate is the one who can create. And so he's the only one worthy of my worship, and he's the only one who can heal me of this sin-sick condition that I find in my heart. Praise God for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that he is alive, that he is a creator and redeemer. And by the way, in Deuteronomy 5, where it gives the Ten Commandments, it uses the salvation motif as well by describing you were slaves in Egypt and you were brought out, therefore keep the Sabbath commandment. You were slaves to sin is the symbolism there. So far we've got the Sabbath instituted in Eden. God's commandments in the Sabbath continue pre-Mount Sinai. Abraham, the, the um, Exodus 16 manna story. Then, of course, the commandments are in place for the remainder of the Old Testament. We have Jesus keeping God's commandments. He says, I've kept my Father's commandments, including the Sabbath, of course. How about the early church and after the time of Jesus? Jesus said something amazing in the prophecy about the fall of Jerusalem. He said, in one generation, you're going to see the fall of Jerusalem. It happened in 70 A.D., almost exactly 40 years from when he made that prophecy. And what did he say? When Jerusalem is encompassed with armies, and you're about to get this, this, this fall of Jerusalem, not one stone will be left on another of the temple. It's going to be destructive, and the Christians are going to need to flee. And he said, woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days, and pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. So there's still such a thing as the Sabbath, four decades out from Jesus' ministry in, uh, in, 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 right there in Matthew 24. So he says, when that comes, one generation from now, the early church, the Christian times after Jesus' ascension into heaven, Christians will still be calling it the Sabbath, the seventh day. And you don't want to be fleeing on that day either because you're going to be observing it like Paul does. Take a look at this in Acts 17, verse 2. Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures. And people say, well, he only went on the Sabbath because he was witnessing to the Jews. Well, take a look at this one in Acts 13. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached unto them the next Sabbath. On the next Sabbath... Almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. So does this sound like just for witnessing to the Jews? No, the Gentiles and almost the whole city of Pisidian Antioch is coming out to hear Paul preach the gospel on the Sabbath. They say, we want to hear these words from you next Sabbath. And he didn't say, well, you know, we don't really observe the Sabbath anymore. We could do this any day. Or he didn't say, you know, we're going to have a new Sabbath. Just come back tomorrow. Why wait a week? You know, it was the next Sabbath because Sabbath is still important. And we can witness any day, of course. But how about when there's no Jewish synagogue? Paul still observes the Sabbath in Acts 16. On the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. So they still had a worship gathering, even where there was no synagogue and house of worship. Now you might say, okay, Scott, I see, of course, God's law is never abolished. I see the Sabbath continues through the New Testament. It's emphasized in the last days as quoted in Revelation 14 as preceding the second coming of Christ. So God's law, God's law is still in place. Am I supposed to like, you know, bring an offering of fine flour to the priests? Am I supposed to get my best lamb from my flock and bring it when I've sinned and go down? Down to the temple. Well, where's the temple? I don't have a temple. Do I go to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles and for the Feast of Unleavened Bread? Do I observe the, the rest days or the Sabbaths that were embedded in those feasts of the Jews? Should we be keeping those Sabbaths as well? You know, there's a very helpful distinction made in the Word of God between the Ten Commandments and the, the ceremonial laws that you find in 
the books of Moses. The Ten Commandments was written by the finger of God. The ceremonial law written by Moses. The Ten Commandments written on tables of stone to show they endure. The ceremonial law handwritten in a scroll. The Ten Commandments inside the Ark of the Covenant. The ceremonial law placed beside the Ark of the Covenant. Now who made this distinction? Did God or man make that distinction? God made that distinction. He said, I'm carving out these stones. We're writing it in stone. We're putting it in the Ark of the Covenant, which is going to be written in your hearts in the New Covenant. And they had it back then, that ability as well, as David did. Ten special laws that are applicable for all people at all times, all societies. Paul says these ceremonial laws you don't have to worry about as Gentile Christians. And this is Colossians 2, a very important text that we're going to spend a couple of minutes on. He says, The blotting out of the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, he, Jesus, took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Now we're going to come back to the middle part in just a second. He's saying these are things which are a shadow of things to come. But the substance is of Christ. So the handwriting of ordinances was contrary to us, against us. It was nailed to the cross because it was just a shadow of things to come. But the reality or the substance is Christ. What's a shadow? It's a foreshadowing. It's a symbol pointing forward to a reality. The Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world, was symbolized by the lamb sacrifice, the Passover lamb. Paul says Christ is our Passover. He's the reality that fulfills the symbol. And when you have the reality, you don't so much need the symbol. He's like, you know what? These are just a shadow of things to come. Jesus took it out of the way. That's why we're not doing lamb sacrifices anymore. The curtain was torn from top to bottom. I use the analogy where um, I've traveled for ministry for a number of years and sometimes I miss my family. So I scroll through some photos of them and I look at the pictures of my family. That's a shadow pointing forward to the reality. It's a symbol. It's not the real thing. Now let me ask you a question. When I roll into my driveway, when I get home from a speaking appointment and my kids are, they don't know I'm there yet, but as soon as that door opens, they're going to come running to the door and it's the greatest moment of human existence to have those children jump onto my lap. Slight hyperbole, but not much. Um, Do I hang out in my car for the rest of the day, like looking at pictures of my kids? Not so. That's just a shadow. I want the real thing now. I want the real thing. Uh, Let's look at the rest of this text now, because it mentions some specifics, like what we were just talking about. The the food and drink offerings of fine flour and the turtle dove and the, the festal Sabbaths, or those rest days that were embedded in the feast calendar of the Jews. He names these specifically. He says, these are the things that are a shadow of things that were to come. Let no one judge you in food or in drink or regard, regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Now, if you look at that text in isolation without the totality of the scriptures or the immediate context where he's talking about the shadow laws of the ceremonial law, you would see the word Sabbath there and you'd go, all right, I'm off the hook. Now I can do whatever I want all seven days. Some have thought that when encountering this text. It mentioned the word Sabbath and that's abolishing the fourth commandment. Eh, Sure, not all ten are abolished, but one of them is. Wait a minute. Was that one written in stone? The fourth commandment, the seventh day Sabbath. Was that a shadow pointing forward to the Lamb of God simply to be a type or shadow that would be fulfilled in Christ? Let me ask you this. When we think about the shadow types of laws that were pointing forward to, hear these words carefully, redemption from sin. The shadows were pointing forward to redemption from sin in the person of Jesus Christ. Redemption from what? From sin. The, the, the Sabbath days that were embedded, the rest days in, in Leviticus 23, the Jews to this day, they talk about their 13 special Sabbaths that they have throughout the year. Those fall on a Thursday or a Tuesday or a Sunday or a Monday or whatever day of the week because it's an annual day on a specific day of the month. Um, those 13 special Sabbaths, when were they instituted? Before or after sin? They were instituted after sin, weren't they? At the time of Moses. 
And so those legitimately are a shadow pointing forward to the reality which is Christ's redemption from sin. How about the seventh day Sabbath of the fourth commandment? When was that instituted? Before or after sin? That was before sin in Genesis 2. So it can't be a, shadow, a mere shadow pointing forward to redemption from sin when there is no sin yet, right? It was a permanent, wired into the fabric of this creation moment when God created this perfect world and he said, I'm sanctifying the seventh day before sin so nobody ever needs to be confused that this is not going anywhere, just as much as marriage isn't going anywhere. Was marriage merely a shadow pointing forward to the reality and we go, seventh commandment? Whew, I'm free to go be promiscuous as much as I want. I don't need to be faithful to my wife. No. That's slavery, by the way, slavery to sin. People call that freedom. But no, marriage was not a mere shadow pointing forward and it's done away with now. Marriage and the seventh commandment is just as wired into the fabric of God's law and designed for God's godly living as the fourth commandment and the Sabbath instituted in Eden. We know that the seventh day Sabbath is not referenced in this scripture because the seventh day Sabbath was not in the handwriting of ordinances. It was written by the finger of God in stone. He's talking about food and drink offerings, ceremonial laws in the context, not the moral code of the Ten Commandments. And the seventh day Sabbath was never contrary to us. John says it's not grievous, it's not burdensome. It says, I will call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord honorable. And that's some people approach the Sabbath and they go, oh, this, and now I have to and I can't. And if, if that's the attitude, I want to go back to square one and see what is the character of God? Does he have my best interest at heart? Will he ask me to do anything that's not for my best good? If the Bible says he opens his hand and satisfies the desire of every living thing. It says I will withhold no good thing from you in the Psalms. And it's, God says, taste and see that the Lord is good. You try out all ten add the fourth commandment to your observance of all ten, and you will find a blessing. He blessed the Sabbath day, didn't he? He sanctified it. And so Paul often confronted the idea that New Testament Christians shouldn't have to do this and this and this because there are certain things that are grievous to them. Making them do lamb sacrifices when the curtain was torn? No, 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 we're done with that. No more animal sacrifices. No more forcing all the Gentiles to come to Jerusalem for the feast days. We don't look at the photograph anymore. We've got the real thing, the true lamb of God. And there was something else that was done away with for the Gentiles. Circumcision. They said, we're not going to require grown men who are coming to the truth of Jesus Christ, to, who are Gentiles, to undergo that procedure. That's not necessary. Now, do you know that caused a lot of controversy among Jewish Christians? And Paul called them dogs. Maybe we shouldn't call them Jewish Christians. But he said, this is, this is mutilators of the flesh and the circumcision group. Massive controversy. Think about if the, the Jewish Christians were that angry about circumcision being done with, some of them, the Judaizers, how angry would they have been if Paul would have said, seventh day, Sabbath, fourth commandment, that's done away with. We're taking a chisel and we're crossing out one of the Ten Commandments. People would have been livid. You'd read nothing else in the New Testament but something relating to that. It would have been the biggest controversy. There's not a word because there was no change, was there? I praise God that there was no change because when we come to Jesus, trusting him and we see in Isaiah 66 that in the new heavens and the new earth the Sabbath is still going to be there you can look that up one up because we're out of time Isaiah 66 23 God says the new heavens and the new earth we will worship before him he never did away with a blessing for us a release valve in our stressful lives where we connect with each other worship him learn of him connect with him it's for our relationship with him and with each other and I need God to require me to do that, or we'll just get busy doing our own thing. It's a gospel message from that angel. He says, I've got good news for you. Remember and worship him who made the heaven, the earth, and the sea. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man. Oh, I don't get it. Why does it matter? It's just a day. We'll talk about that tomorrow. But in the, way, in the end thereof is the way of death. The way that seemeth right unto a man ends in the way of death. God never said... Pick your own day, do your own thing, do what thou wilt. He says, I have a law, and if you delight in it, because you love me, you will find great peace. Do you want that peace tonight? This is, this is an accepting of God's authority. When you pray this prayer with me, it's yes, I will obey. Dear Jesus, 
we want to say that we love you and we will therefore keep your holy Sabbath day. We know that your commandments are not grievensome. We want to delight in that day and know you because we are walking with you. Not to earn your love, but because you have loved us first. In Jesus' name.